Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Trade Talk, week two of the AFL Finals. We bid farewell to Sydney and St Kilda. Eight has become six. A couple of big semi-finals this week to see who takes on Collingwood and Brisbane who have won their way through to preliminary finals with impressive performances out of the week just gone. Darren Park and is my name, Tom Happel, alongside of me through this final series. And Tom, will dissect the games a bit later on, but what was your main takeaway from week one? Yeah, good to be with you again, Daz. Four really, um, I suppose, competitive games up to up to half time at least uh, in the first week of, of the finals. Um, I think my takeaway, uh, my main takeaway would be the GWS Giants. I think what an exceptional year they've had. They've exceeded all expectations and I think they go in um, certainly in the market as unders against Port this week. Um, but I think they, they're a big chance in that. So looking forward to that match and, and knock out football from here on in. Yeah, the two Saturday winners, Brisbane and, and GWS, played outstanding footy on that particular day. And obviously Collingwood and Carlton with hard fought and very significant wins in the days before that. Todd Davies with us from Stats Insider. And, and Todd, what was your main takeaway from the first week in terms of uh, the predictions, models and, and just your general thoughts? Yeah, I think Collingwood and Brisbane separated themselves from the pack. So our models say it's a 42.3% chance that Collingwood and Brisbane meet in this year's grand final, which would be a huge result. And you know, anyone's contest, given the way both those teams are playing. Throwback to 20 years ago and the back-to-back -back grand finals that those two teams played in 2002 and 2003. If it does get to that point, we'll dissect those a little bit later on. We played a game called Rapid Fire last week, and we're going to throw to that again now. I'll... Chuck these around the panel. I'll start with you, Tom, with my first question. Can you mount a case for either Collingwood or Brisbane to lose their preliminary finals? Uh, I think it's difficult to mount a case, Does I think uh, certainly Collingwood are perhaps more gettable, I feel, than, than the uh, Brisbane Lions at the Gabba. Um, it's easy to forget that, say, if GWS were to win their semi-final this week, that in 2019, they actually beat Collingwood in the prelim final uh, at the MCG. So certainly from that perspective, um, if they were to meet again, the Giants would be chock full of confidence there and they won't fear that task. And uh, if they um, were to make it, uh, it's important to note that Stephen Canelio and Toby Green were missing from that particular prelim final as well. So um, they'll hold, hold no fears there. Um, Carlton, if they were to meet Brisbane in a potential prelim, um, I think Brisbane would feel confident because they've won last, the last four of uh, their five matchups against um, the Blues, and whereas they've only beaten Melbourne four of the past ten. So I think certainly from that perspective, um, Brisbane will, be, will feel confident against the Blues rather than the Ds. And, um, but certainly they'll both go in as warm favourites, Collingwood and Brisbane. Collingwood likely to bring back the Brown or potential Brownlow medalist in, in Nick Dacos for, for that match as well. Certainly the equal Brownlow favourite. And, and Todd, you did mention the 42% the probability on those sides playing in a grand final. Is there a sense on the stats inside of modelling that one is more, more gettable than the other? Well, we've been pretty consistent on um, Brisbane making the grand final throughout leading into the... Um, into the final series. We've got Brisbane right now at 65.9% to make their grand final and Collingwood at 63.1%. So both teams are more likely to make it this stage than this. So that's a really interesting stat. But, you know, it's finals footy. You never know what can happen. As mentioned, GWS beat Collingwood with no one gave them a chance. So probabilities can tell, tell us part of the story. But, you know, it's, it, you've got to wait till they play on the match day. So the Giants, to make the grand final, would have to win three consecutive interstate finals, which would be sort of Adelaide 1998-type territory if they were to do that. Um, next one, Tom. The AFL still doesn't know exactly where it sits on concussion, given the Braden Maynard situation. Really interesting topic, Daz, and, and a sensitive topic uh, for good reason. I think um, I'm certainly of the belief that accidents do happen uh, on the football field, and it's impossible to fully eradicate concussion from the game, I suppose. Um, some examples uh, include, you know, players flying for the high mark, smothering the ball, as we saw with <clears throat> Maynard on the weekend, um, even colliding with an umpire accidentally. You know, these are all, I suppose, things that can just happen on a football field and have the potential to cause concussion. But I think it's fair to say the AFL are stuck uh, on this issue, as demonstrated with them 
appealing their own um, match review officer in Michael Christian's decision to initially, I suppose, let Maynard off. Um, and then they appealed that. And so certainly I think if they can't put faith in their own people, then I think that itself demonstrates disunity. And the issue itself is is really topical with the likes of Johnny Platten, mm. um, I suppose, uh, launching a lawsuit against the AFL. So I think, or a class action, should I say. So really topical and, and a really difficult one to answer. Yeah, and obviously that documentary was on this week of, of all weeks, obviously the timing of that. Uh, the next one, if you were given the keys to one of the two sides that were beaten on the weekend, who has the immediate upside, St Kilda or Sydney, if you were given the keys to one of those two cars? I think the Swans does, which won't please you, but I think <laughs> uh, they'll likely get Brody Grundy and Ben Mackay from North Melbourne in the door as recruits at season's end or for 2024 and both players both of those guys have plenty of footy left in them to go with the, their young core Errol Goulden, Chad Warner, Hayden McLean who was dominant on the weekend, Nick Blakey, Braden Campbell and Tom McCartan there are just some of the the young guns for Sydney that I've named there and I think their balance of their list is probably better than St Kilda as it stands and um, St Kilda have an ageing midfield and, um, yeah, probably a lack of star power in that regard. So uh, I think the Swans, but certainly a shout-out to Mitch Owens, though, who I think could um, emerge as one of those star players that I just mentioned that is much needed for the Saints. And the other one, Wanganine Miller, I think had a sure. um, tremendous season. But, yeah, Sydney with the likes of, of Goulden and, and obviously the post-Buddy era already looking pretty good for them. In the, uh, in the forward line in particular, and I guess, Todd, same question for you in terms of the, the Saints or the Swans heading into 2024. I'd go St Kilda. I really like their age profile. I think it's the fourth youngest list across the board in terms of age, average age. I really like what they did with injuries when they went down. Max King's potentially a, a Coleman medalist. Mitch Owens, as mentioned, great talent. And Roel Marshall finally displayed exactly what he's got in terms of skill set. He's one of the best ruckmen in the league. I think they're great. And as mentioned, Wanganine Miller, he, he has the potential to be an Australian type wingman slash um, silky forward. I think he's almost Sean Berger reincarnated. So I really like where St Kilda's at. And Ross Lyon really, really stamped his authority in another year, another preseason. There's plenty of upside at St Kilda. Yeah, I think I read St Kilda with champion data were the youngest of the top eight sides in terms of average age profile and, and games played. And you mentioned Brodie Grundy with Sydney. At the time of recording, Port Adelaide have pulled out of that race. So that just green lights uh, Brodie Grundy to mm. Sydney, you would think, is a, a virtual formality now. Um, so there are six finalists left in, in terms of a hypothetical game. I'll go around the panel if they could take one player from the 12 sides that are not in, so they can't grab it from another finalist, they have to get it from a side that's no longer playing this season. I'll go team by team first with you, Tom. Collingwood, who are they taking? I've written down Larky or Oscar Allen, uh, Daz, I think, uh, for obvious reasons. They're in need of a tall forward and, and more goals, and I think those two are the best forwards um, from teams who didn't make the, the finals this year, so I'll go with those two. Todd, I'm very similar. Where, where do you sit with Collingwood? I would take James Sisley from Hawthorne. He's ranked number eight in our player ratings, and he he's just that perfect foil for Darcy Moore and Nathan Murphy. I think he gives the opportunity to lock down on a defender or use the ball brilliantly outside of defence. So I'd probably consolidate down back and bring in Sisley. Yeah, that, you'd probably never score against them with that type of setup. Uh, GWS... Tom, where's uh, an area they can add to? I think the midfield does. So I've written down Took Miller or Andrew Brayshaw as another gun mid that, that they could use. But uh, certainly they've, they've done well in the first final with Tom Green being absolutely, absolutely dominant, Josh Kelly. Um, but they could use one more, I suppose, pure ball winner as well. So that's why I've chosen those two. Todd? I'd go Dustin Martin, big game player, can rotate through the midfield, as you mentioned there. Um, they lack a few options and a match winner up forward to complement Toby Green. I think he'd be perfect for GWS. I like Briggs in the ruck. However, I think given how well their midfield is playing at the moment and the fact that these guys can drift forward a little bit, maybe one elite ruckman who can get 25, 30 possessions yep. in a game. So Rowan Marshall or Tim English, I think, would um, would really round them out and, and you could play them forward and, and rotate through that and really help their midfield. Those, those two ruckman players are fourth midfielder, effectively, when they're in there. Brisbane Lions, Tom. Very well-balanced outfit, yes. as we know it does. So I'm not sure they could use, I suppose, too many 
additions to upset the balance, but Charlie Ballard is one from left field that I've chosen here. I think um, he could be a potential upgrade in their defence, and that's where Brisbane, if they do have one weakness, that could be it. So, yeah, one from left field, but I really rate Charlie Ballard, and, and there's an option there. Tom? Taking a look, I, I really like the idea of bringing in Tom Hawkins, a reliable goal kicker up forward, can stay at home, so Eric Hipwood and Joe Danaher can get on their bike. I think he would complement Brisbane perfectly and they'd be almost impossible to beat with an accurate goal kicker. Yeah, and Danaher could play as a second ruckman in that formation. I've gone, I have mean, gone. I love their midfield anyway with Dunkley and Neil and McCluggage and, and the like going through there, Zorko, but I think if you slotted another elite mid like Bontempelli into that group, a midfielder that can kick goals, uh, complementing an already potent scoring machine, I think that would round them out very nicely. Uh, Port Adelaide, Tom. Gone another left field one here, Daz. I've said Brennan Cox from Frio. He's a South Australian lad. Um, and as we know, Port need uh, defensive reinforcement in a major way. So I think Brennan Cox, um, obviously a hypothetical world here, but I think he would be a good addition for Port. Todd? Yeah, thinking along the same lines, but a little bit differently, a big man, Tim English. I'd like to have him come in, chop out in the ruck, and at an option up forward, I think he would provide a great a great skill set to that team. I have the same answer as I did for Collingwood in, in a Nick Larkey type player. Um, I agree with their defensive stocks, but I think also key position forwards. Obviously, Dixon's battled injuries and, and a little bit of form. Finlayson can give them a lot around the ground. And uh, having Marshall, who's tall but slight, I think getting another accurate set shot kicker in there who can take a high mark and compete would give them their best chance at winning the flag. So Larkey for mine. What about the Ds? Oh, what they'd give for Nick Larkey yeah. at the moment does. Reliable set shot. Um, and yeah, not only would he kick goals, he'd, he'd make the most of every every opportunity up front. So I think, um, yeah, he's one of the most accurate kicks in the league and the Ds could certainly use that at the minute. Yeah, I think it's um, written everywhere for the Ds that um, scoring is their issue. So I'm on the same page, Todd. Thinking along the same lines, but I'm going a different player, Jeremy Cameron. He was in the frame for being the best player in the competition up until he went down with injury. Goal kicking can get up the ground. I think he is, if he's not top three, he's definitely top five player in the AFL. And he kicks goals, multiple goals. Um, yeah, Jezza Cameron for me. And when I say Larky, you can throw in, we mentioned Oscar Allen, even Tex would be a good fit. Yep. Um, you know, big competing player, any of those types of key position forwards. And Carlton rounding that out, Tom. Gone for Isaac Rankin here, Daz. Um, so the Blues could do with a bit of an upgrade, I feel, um, of their small players in the forward line at ground level. Um, so obviously the likes of Mitch Owies, Motlop um, and Lockie Fogarty at the moment are at the feet of Colonel and Mackay and yeah, Isaac Rankin would be a great fit uh, the, at the feet of Big Charlie for sure. I've gone ruck for them as well. Um, with, I know Pitney can, can certainly do a, a solid job for them but similar to what I had earlier with, with Marshall or English, uh, Ruckman who can get the footy, complement a very strong midfield, go forward and kick a goal. I think that would help them out nicely with... They're obviously, their key position defence is pretty good with, with Wiedering and obviously what they're getting out of Young and, and these sorts of players. And then obviously Kerno leading that forward line is elite, but Todd? I'd go Jordan Dawson, uh, add, add some class to that midfield and also the, a player that can go back across the half-back line if the game's tight late. We saw Jack Martin, who won't be out there against Melbourne, uh, do that really effectively against... Um, Against the Swans when it mattered most, I think Jordan Dawson would be the perfect fit for Carlton. Yeah, he's had a, a super year and putting you on the spot, Tom, if your kangaroos could do the same thing heading into next year, who would that be? Oh, that's a good question, Daz. All of the above. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the Roos need all the talent they can get, but um, I'd probably say a Took Miller or an Andrew Brayshaw type just to round off um, the midfield, which, um, as we know, is really promising uh, on paper moving forward, but just another senior body in there I think we could use, so I'll go with one of those two. Yeah, and they've got a bit of their homegrown talent. Obviously, Larky is already on their list as one of those, and um, complimenting Sheasel and Wardlaw and, and early picks that they'll get this time around, but your turn to throw some out. All right, so I'll start off with, I suppose, the most topical um, question of the week. Braden Maynard, should he have been banned, or was the right call made to throw out the case? It's interesting, all of the opinions I saw on social media were completely clear-cut, as in absolutely no case to answer mm. or can't play again this year. I agree with the way it's panned out in that it was incredibly complex. You obviously had Michael Christian let it go, then you had the AFL appeal that, send it to the tribunal, the tribunal hearing went for several hours, there was 
various ways of looking at it. It's, it's not clear cut. So clearly Maynard's sole intention was to smother the footy. I don't think in midair he changed his mind and thought, oh, I can clean up Brayshaw here and take him out of the game. I don't think that ever occurred. But that, do that obviously doesn't change the duty of care. Is there anything he sure. can do in the air? Can he pivot away? Can he... Uh, is there anything he can do with his body? Put his arms out. Exactly, and, him, yeah. and, and you know, potentially give a free kick away, which he did anyway for, for down the ground. So um, I, I feel that had he have been punished, he would have been punished for the outcome, not the action. And generally, I don't like that. I think either the action's illegal or it's not. Um, I didn't like some of the stuff that came out with, you know, the way certain Collingwood people were defending it and the way certain Melbourne people were condemning it. There's I think a lot there was a fair bit of emotion, involved, emotion yeah. involved in it. But I haven't really answered the question, needless to say, it's incredibly complex. Um, I, I think I'm leaning towards the, the fact that they got it right. It was a football incident, but it's not as, pardon the pun, black and white as people would make it out to be. Todd, I'll throw to you quickly. Um, a Port Adelaide unders this week uh, at a dollar sixty-five on the exchange currently. I don't think so. I really like GWS, and the model agrees. We've got about a three percent edge to beat Port Adelaide um, on paper at home. Top four team, you'd be spot on thinking Port Adelaide would go into this one as their favourites, but. GWS, 43% win probability. Um, they're almost approaching 50-50% there. Giants couldn't have been more impressive against the Saints. Sorry, Daz. But we're, we're looking at a Giants team who's taken every opportunity that's been presented to them. And uh, Port Adelaide aren't playing the best footy. They were probably jumped by Brisbane and never got back in the contest. So GWS presents great value. And yeah, to answer your question, no, I don't think they're unders. I think they're, they're, it could get closer to that $2 mark come, come bounce time. Uh, Daz, are the Blues a better team without Harry Mackay in it? It's slightly, uh, I suppose, mm. controversial, but they seem in the home and away season to have, um, I suppose, benefited in a, in a strange way from his absence. It uh, declutters the forward line. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's funny. It's like the Buddy thing at Sydney where Buddy's one of the all-time greats of the game, but maybe by the end of it, their forward line was a bit less predictable when he wasn't there. Or, or you look at the 2011 grand final when Podsy Adley gets injured. Yeah good player, but Geelong's forward line functioned better as soon as that happened with, with Tom Hawkins one out. Carlton, theoretically, are always going to be better for Harry's presence because he's a star, but I agree entirely with what you're saying. He's a little bit out of form at the moment. His kicking for goal has been patchy, I think, at, at best, and, and obviously Charlie is at the absolute height of his powers. So I'd say it's functioning better, but I'm not prepared to say they're a better side without him because Harry Mackay is a star and should, by rights, make them better. But just at the moment, that's not quite clicking. Mm, fair enough. Um, next question. Uh, this is slightly on a broader scale, Daz, but why is set-shot goal-kicking uh, performed so poorly in the modern era? I'm not sure. You have to be Nostradamus <laughs> to answer this, but uh, can you just give us your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's one of the only aspects of the game that probably hasn't improved historically. And... The, the thing that people always point to is fatigue, where these days the gut running where a player would lead for five, six, seven hundred metres, then take a mark and then have 30 seconds to have a shot and they're still kicking under fatigue. And that's often been pointed to as the reason why that happens. But I don't think it necessarily should be because you'd argue that field kicking hasn't diminished in that sense. And, and we were talking about it before the show that if you put a player on the ground and put another player 50 metres away from him and said, kick it to that player without him moving, they would lace him out every time. So why can't they do that over a goal umpire's hat or, or something of that nature? So fatigue is pointed to as the reason, but I'm not sure I'm necessarily copying that. I think it's probably a little bit more mental. Sure. And lastly, Todd, I'll, I'll just throw this one to you. A Brisbane, the team to beat for the flag? I think that's absolutely the case right now. They're the favourites with us at... 33.3% to win the Premiership. Uh, they'll be hard to beat at the Gabba, haven't lost this year. So I'm pretty confident they'll beat whoever they face um, after the semi-final stage. And we, we did see, even though they did lose to Melbourne, they got out to a pretty strong lead in that game and just got run down. Uh, they're playing at MCG a lot better than they were. They're, if they go, come up against Collingwood, they'll be pretty confident. They've had a great record against them recently. And they played amazing footy against Port Adelaide. So I'll be very confident in Brisbane coming into the finals. But what do you guys think? Yeah, I think you're right on Brisbane in that they've, history says they're losing at the MCG, but they haven't always played badly there. Sometimes it's been within matches where they've dominated and then slipped away for a bit. They would feel that when they're on, they're on at the G and they score heavily and 
uh, that Melbourne game will leave some mental scars, but they dominated 90% of that game. So, And I think it's important yeah. to, to note as well, guys, that in the final series last year, the, the, uh, the Lions had a big scalp over the Ds um, as well. Was that in the semi-final in the semis, last year? Yep. So yep. they'll take confidence that they can do it on the biggest stage at the MCG. Definitely. And um, Collingwood always feel they can win from any position, so that would expose some of those mm. mental demons a little bit. But... Um, time will ultimately tell. The Trade Talk medal, obviously we didn't have that last week coming off uh, the buy rounds, but it is back. Uh, I'll go through the honourable mentions and then Tom will bring us our votes. Blake Akers, superb game for Carlton on Friday night. Sam Walsh, probably not their best player, but was very good. Uh, won a lot of the football. Uh, amongst the Brisbane side, I thought Hugh McCluggage played a tremendous game. Josh Kelly for the Giants and Lockie Ash, who had 31 possessions. Uh, I thought Steele and Marshall played a lone hand for St Kilda in the middle in their game. And Will Hoskin Elliott, probably a slightly obscure one, but had 10 rebounds, 5 tackles, 19 of his possessions were kicks on Thursday night. And he was part of the reason why Melbourne struggled to penetrate the forward line. He kept rebounding and intercepting and, and was part of that very good defensive unit. So he gets an honourable mention. But where did you land on the votes? So one vote this week does Hayden McLean for me in the, in the yep. Swans um, loss against the Blues. It, certainly a breakout game for him with 12 marks. Can you believe that? 12 marks and 11 hitouts. In so, the wet too. Yeah. Uh, in the wet. So great game from the big fella. So he's, he, he'll have one vote this week from me. Two votes. Uh, Tom Green for his 35 disposal effort uh, in a win against the Saints. Um, and he was the best player on the ground in that game too. And then three votes this week. Joe Danaher, five goals in a big win. Uh, and he was accurate this week too, which he so often isn't. So um, they're the votes for this week, does. Yeah, bags in a final are, are very, very rare. We'll jump into our deep dive, which takes a look at those finals. We'll summarise what did happen. Thursday night, Collingwood beats Melbourne by seven points. They withhold an enormous onslaught. Melbourne had something like 53 entries to 22 after quarter time. Tom, what did you make of Collingwood's win there? Yeah, so obviously Collingwood got the jump on Melbourne with a four-goal to one first quarter, Daz, and that probably proved decisive in the end uh, as Melbourne were chasing tail the rest of the game. Um, Melbourne's big three in Gorn, Oliver and Petrarca all stood up, but it fell away a bit um, in terms of their depth, uh, and uh, sort of their depth in a way was exposed um, in many respects. Uh, Melbourne's forward line problems have been well documented with the likes of Petty, Melksham and Ben Brown all out with injury. Uh, and this was even more glaring in the qualifying final um, as they won the inside 50 count, as you just mentioned, by 32. Um, and then they obviously failed to capitalise on that. Um, so that'd be, um, I suppose, a positive in many respects, but also something to work on for them this week. Uh, we mentioned Jacob Van Royen on the show last week as needing to have a big game and uh, unfortunately, he, he only had the six touches, no goals, and was quiet overall and copped an untimely suspension. So um, certainly the Ds are on the back foot this week against a good Blues defence. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. Um, Collingwood, they, they did well at the clearances, uh, Collingwood, so they got within four of the Ds. Uh, they won uncontested ball, and they'll be buoyed by the fact that you know, their stars, Pendlebury, just 15 touches, Jamie Elliott, just six disposals, and, and um, Josh Dacos, just 14 disposals, all had quiet games, yet they were still able to get the, get the chocolates. So I think there's upside to come for the Pies, and especially with Nick Dacos to return to the lineup. So um, I think from both teams, they, they both played well, but Obviously, the Pies get the much-needed week off and a chance to rest and recuperate. The last team to lose a final with 30 more inside 50s was Geelong in the 2016 prelim against Sydney at the MCG. Uh, Sydney were seven goals up at quarter time and similar, obviously, withheld a, a territory onslaught after that. Um, Carlton and Sydney on the Friday night, Todd, uh, mentioned that Sydney were slightly, I guess, underrated by the markets leading into that game, but... For the first half, it looked like the market had that right with Carlton all over them, but then Sydney stormed home and, and probably just ran out of time. They got within a kick in the last minute. Yeah, as previously mentioned, putting Jack Martin behind the ball worked out really well for Carlton. They're a little bit aimless with their forward 50 entries, but they did storm back and nearly pinch it, and they're probably unlucky too in the end. Um, I know Sydney fans will 
would be pretty aggrieved with the, the score review process, but they can't complain considering that <laughs> they got over the, over the line uh, with, uh, through Adelaide. But yeah, Carlton played a great game of footy. Blake Akers um, could, have, could have been the number th getting three votes with the trade talk medal. He was terrific. Sam Walsh was prolific. Um, George Hilton, Adam Chera are great, but Adam Sard off the halfback flank, he was terrific. Uh, I think he was exactly what they needed coming into last year's final series when they just missed out. He, he really adds some great ball use, great run, and just really complements what Carlton do. And, you know, he'll be relied upon pretty heavily against Melbourne uh, to drive off halfback and set up some scores going forward. Tom, what did you make of it? Um, Carlton led by as much as 35 points, ended up hanging on by six. Yeah, Sydney kicked seven, eight, uh, seven goals eight in the second half, Daz. So as we mentioned off the top, uh, poor goalkeeping is, is poor football. So that costs them in the end. Um, just a quick one for you, Daz. So the Blues um, were perhaps a bit nervous in the last quarter with holding on to the lead and with the weight of expectation with, you know, thousands of Blues fans, long-suffering Blues fans, um, wanting their, uh, the, to break the duck in after a long wait. Um, do you think they ran out of gas or do you think it was just a case of, yeah, nerves in the last quarter there? Potentially. Sydney turned the momentum and it was hard to stop, I guess, from that point. But we did see Carlton probably play a little bit tighter and a little bit safer with their, their ball use in that point. So I'd say it was a combination of fatigue, momentum and then the enormity of the occasion. But they, they sure. did stand up with that. That Acres goal was, was really significant for them. All that matters is that they're through yeah. at the end of the day. Exactly, it, so. and, and you feel they'll be better, certainly, for that experience and, and coming to this week with a bit of confidence. St Kilda, GWS, uh, a tight first 15, 20 minutes, and the Giants dominated for about the next 45 minutes. St Kilda did mini rallies twice to, to cut the margin from seven goals back to three on, on two occasions, but then the Giants were able to withstand all of that, their, their outside run, their small forwards, their spread was all phenomenal over the course of the, uh, of the afternoon. St Kilda at times looked a bit flat. We know on reflection there may have been a reason for that, but sure. in saying that, the Giants um, too strong and, and carried some tremendous momentum into the finals. Yeah, so Saints would be disappointed, Daz, mm. by their uh, defence. So they conceded just 100 points uh, for the second time this season, and that came, unfortunately in an elimination final. So a bit to work work on for the Saints in the off season there, but certainly the Giants finals pedigree showed. I think they had uh, 10 plus players who had played uh, in the grand final of 2019 playing in that game. So on the big stage, their calmness and composure showed, played a big role. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the emergence of Toby Bedford. Yeah. Um, what a fantastic recruit he's been. Could argue he's been the recruit of the year, um, two goals and 16 odd possessions, but um, really impactful possessions as well. Um, always seems to hit a target or, or get a hand in and, and you know influence the play. So along with Brent Daniels uh, and of course Toby Green, who on the day actually wasn't that effective, the Saints did a good job of keeping him to one goal, but the Giants have great scope for improvement uh, as this final series uh, progresses and yeah, certainly I think uh, against Port, as we'll touch on later in the show, I think um, they'll go in uh, confident in that game. And Bedford obviously had the, the marathon tribunal, the three appeals or the two appeals, three cases and, and got up. And yeah, Toby Green's goal came 90 seconds into the game and then he was reasonably well held after that. But Daniel and, and Bedford and various others, uh, Riccardi uh, in the forward line were really influential. Brisbane Port Adelaide Lions outstanding midfield display in particular. They're now 12 from 12 at the Gabba this year and they've been a top four side for about five years but this is clearly the best they've looked in terms of being primed and, and ready for an assault on a flag and Todd they were probably, I know you could mount a case for the, the Giants as well, but the Lions probably the most impressive team in week one of the finals. Yeah without question and though they're Vindication to get Joe Danaher to the club was really proven. As you guys mentioned earlier, he, he was great in front of the sticks. Five goals won. Goal kicking's always been his issue, but he was brilliant in front of goals. He also had the in, three inside of 50s to go with it, so he's giving them off and he's kicking goals. If he's in that kind of form going into the, the preliminary and potentially a grand final, then Brisbane is going to be really, really hard to stop. We shift our attention to this week, Melbourne and Carlton. So the D's 
looking to avoid a second consecutive straight sets exit. Obviously, last year they went out to Sydney and Brisbane trying to avoid the same fate in consecutive years. They've had a bit of bad luck, obviously, with Max Gorn with a broken toe and the Van Ruyen suspension, the Melksham injury the week before, and uh, other little issues that they've had. Petty, obviously, who they swung forward getting injured as well a few weeks back. Uh, Carlton riding a good wave of momentum. They lose Harry Mackay, but but obviously got a bit more of a forward structure that they would like. Tom, how are you? In fact, we'll go to Todd first in terms of the probability for Stats Insider on this one. The market has Melbourne as favourites at a dollar sixty-six, I think it is at the moment, and then Carlton at two dollars thirty-two. That market has moved ever so slightly. I think it opened at a dollar sixty-four two thirty-five. So $1.74, 232 my mistake. Yeah, Melbourne's 59% winning probability, but it's all, it's got to come down to injuries. And we, as mentioned, Max Gorn battling a toe injury. And there's a little bit of a question on Clary Oliver too. Two of their prime movers and two of their better players from their from the qualifying final against Collingwood. So it will be a big wait and watch. I think both players will play, but if they're under duress, it's going to make it tough against the Carlton side, as you mentioned, riding that wave of momentum. Yeah, two of the best midfields in the comp go head-to-head here, Daz, and that'll go a long way to determining the results. So they both rank in the top three for contestant ball this season, and um, yeah, what a, what a couple of matchups you know we've got to look forward to in there with Walsh, Cripps, Chera up against Petrarca, Oliver and Viney. That's um, mouth-watering stuff to look forward to, and um, as you mentioned, both teams will be missing key players. Van Roo and Angus Brayshaw with the concussion forced out for the Ds and Harry Mackay and Jack Martin to miss for the Blues. So in a sense, they sort of balance, uh, balance each other out. And um, yeah, this could be a low scoring affair with both defences ranking high um, in percentage of one-on-one defensive contests one. Um, and yeah, I think Carlton are a bit overpriced at 230 compared to Melbourne's $1.74 as it stands. And um, the Ds are rightful favourites, but yeah, I think they probably should be a bit closer together on the on the exchange. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think Melbourne deserve to be favourites, but but close to even money. Melbourne just ever so slight favourites. And yeah, going to be fascinating. They met about a month ago and Carlton won by four points. That, that controversial-ish finish with the Petrarca long-range shot at goal. Pretty much on the bell, Port Adelaide and GWS. Port Adelaide, again, looking to avoid a straight set exit. It would be a disappointing end to a season where there were periods in it where they looked fantastic. Obviously, going back home is a significant advantage. You look at Melbourne Carlton, that's a neutral final, whereas this is an advantage to Port Adelaide to be playing on their own deck. GWS, 11 wins from 14 matches. Midfield is in better form than Port Adelaide's midfield, certainly, but Port did thump the Giants about three weeks ago at the same ground in the same fixture. So uh, that's one thing to count. But Todd, how is the probability looking for this one? Port $1.66, GWS two forty eight. So much like Melbourne, Port Adelaide are at 57% win probability. So above 50%, but not by a long stretch. And it's interesting on the exchange, the odds are much better in Port's favour compared to Melbourne. But I think Port Adelaide are much more gettable than Melbourne right now. And GWS will go in with confidence, even though they were pretty comprehensively beaten earlier in the season. But as you mentioned about Carlton running that wave of momentum, the Giants are absolutely cruising into this one. And we've got a 3% edge on them at the, at, on the exchange right now. I agree, Todd. Yeah, we'll touch on that in buy, hold and sell. But I think an upset could be on the cards here as well. Um, Porter banged up and lacking personnel in, in defence and with their forward line not functioning probably as it should be either or as they'd like it to. Um, yeah, GWS are, are, are sort of flying on all all fronts as well with all their guns playing well and they're a near full side um, to, to pick from and Cornelio... Uh, from all reports, will be back this week as well. So, yeah, I'm keen uh, keen on the Giants as well. Uh, that would brings us to the wrap of those previews. We look at the buy, hold, and sell, and then we'll wrap things up with a bit of the trading strategy. For for my buy, I'm looking at if you look at probabilities to win the flag at this point on the markets. If you believe that Collingwood and Brisbane are largely or highly unlikely to lose those preliminary finals, you then probably frame what a market would look like if they played each other in a grand final. So 
Collingwood might be a dollar sixty-five, Brisbane two ten, something like that. So Collingwood a two seventy for the flag, Brisbane a three thirty-five for the flag. So whoever you think wins the matchup between those two sides, maybe back them now where you get the better odds. Obviously they've still got a prelim to win, but I'd be looking at you. You're working out your strategy on that. But who's your buy? My buy, is, as just mentioned, Daz, is GWS yep. at 250 uh, on the exchange. I think that represents uh, terrific value this week in their semi final versus Port. And it's taken me a while this season to, to come around to GWS, but they've exceeded all my expectations. And just watching them against the Saints, they seem like a really cohesive unit and, and one that's sort of um, peaking at the right time of the year. So GWS have a strong record at the Adelaide Oval. Uh, they've actually won six of their last 10. Uh, games at the Adelaide Oval, so um, similar to you know their record seemingly at all the way grounds, they seem to go well um, with their backs against the wall, so um, they'll have a full team in, um, assuming Cornelio returns from injury, and uh, Port are the opposite. Port will have in injury concerns with Williams and McKenzie uh, going down last week, and Charlie Dixon still uh, unavailable with um, his injury, so all the pressure will be on will be on Ken's men, and uh, as they prepare to avoid a straight sets exit, and uh, yeah, questions will be certainly asked about whether Port uh, re-signed Ken prematurely if they were to exit in straight sets. So, all the pressure on one club, and Giants might be flying under the radar. Looking for a fourth preliminary final appearance under Ken Hinckley if they do win that game, Port Adelaide. The I haven't got a hold, but selling, we touched on it off the start of the show, the inconsistency, I guess, around the AFL where they appeal their own decisions. They come down hard on concussion in some aspects of it. In other ones, they, you know, they're know they prepared to accept that, that accidents do happen. They adjudicate things slightly differently in finals to what they would do in home and away games. Yeah. There's the layers of the legal processes around. And um, I'm still not sure that, I mean, yes, they are taking it seriously. And yes, it is complex, but I'm not sure their messaging around all of that is as consistent as it needs to be. Who are your cells? I agree, Daz, yeah. So my cell, um, Jacob Van Royen and, and Jack Martin hurting their teams with suspensions at, at key key moment in the season. I, I get finals should be played on the edge, um, but yeah, neither of those actions were, were were tough or necessary in my opinion. So given Melbourne's issue issues with uh, forward line personnel at the moment um, and Jack Martin playing in his first final series uh, in his 10-year career. Uh, I just think both players should know better and they're gonna, that'll be costly for, for both Melbourne and, and the Blues this week, their absences. Todd, do you have a view on uh, on that? I do. I think the, the sell for me is the Twitter discourse around the Maynard decision. Uh, see, Will Schofield and Nathan Buckley going at it in terms of the Maynard decision. I don't think they're two of the most impartial guys going around with Will Schofield uh, uh, wearing his hatred for Collingwood on the sleeve, and we know what Bucks did for Collingwood. So I'm selling the Twitter discourse. We're done with it. Let's move on. Let's get to the footy. Yeah, I think Will pointed out that the tribunal head was a Collingwood supporter, but um, then Nathan Buckley you know, defending the integrity. In terms of trading strategy, similar to last week, you look at the multis that are available on the Betfair Exchange. Obviously, only two matches to look at, but all four combinations are there for you. So if you sit there and think, oh, I think Melbourne will bounce back, but Port Adelaide are vulnerable, you can go Melbourne and GWS at 360. If you're the other way around and you think Port will hang on and Carlton can win, Carlton and Port is 385. Uh, if you think both upsets will occur, Carlton and GWS at 580, there's a bit of value in that. Or if you think that both favourites will respond as history says happens, you get 280 on Melbourne and Port. So if I was to encourage people to play, I'd look at that and, and basically figure out where you think the upset sits and, and go with your, uh, your multi there. Uh, Tom, what's your strategy? My strategy, uh, I feel like I'm broken record here, but GWS at 250, great, great price. Overs clearly for me, um, for all the reasons just outlined. And um, the other, I suppose we revert back to the hold here, but uh, Brisbane obviously won their way through to the prelim, and that bodes well for our um, our multi Brisbane into Marcus Bond and Pelly for the Brownlows. So fingers crossed, uh, those two um, continue to continue to win in coming weeks, does? Yeah, and that, that Brownlow market still hovering around with Bont and Pally and Dacos exchanging favouritism, and you can still get those doubles, even if you wanted to bet on that now, the Marcus Bont and Pally brisbane arrangement, you still get $10.50 on that. So 
Um, if you wanted to, to have a look at that again, you certainly still can. Now that's been it for us on Trade Talk this week. We'll preview a couple of preliminary finals next week. Six will become four, and we get closer to the big dance. We are going to have a live Brownlow show with the help of Stats Insider. We're going to do some fun things across Grand Final Week as well. If your team is amongst the remaining six, good luck for the run-in, and we'll catch you again for Trade Talk. Chances are you're about to lose. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.